test, test, test. morning Mount Zion Church family, the ones who are here, I guess you all, all survived the storm okay, it was mostly um, wind, not too much rain, but you know I, I looked at the, what was happening in Daytona and it, was, it wasn't pretty, all the hotels and townhouses about to fall into the ocean and you know I was, I was telling my wife yesterday, you know the Bible talks about people that build their houses on sand and sure enough the, the water just eroded everything. So we, we thank God it is, as far as I know, there are only two lives that were lost. And those were two people that were electrocuted. One guy um, got out of his car and touched a wire. And then his sister came out to try to help him and she got electrocuted also. So, so but I'm glad that um, Mount Zion Church family, you're all okay. And the church family all over Florida and also... Um, that we're, um, we're here now today to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So today our study is entitled, Christ's Victory Over Death. This, this should be an interesting study, and um, I have my two, my two cohorts with me, Sister Natasha McCoy. Blessed well, Sabbath to everyone, and we thank God for another Sabbath lesson, and I pray that we all get what we need from it. Okay, and Elder Michael Bob. Good morning, it's a blessing to be here. This is a very interesting study. I know that we'll be blessed. Okay. All right, so before we start, would you like to pray for us? Yes. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again. We thank you so much. And Lord, you are gracious. Father, teach us. And Lord, as you teach us, we ask that you prepare our hearts, prepare our minds to hear your truth. Father, reveal yourself to us. And thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so let's hit the road running. All right, so our topic is Christ's victory over death. Our memory text states, When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He put his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the one who lives. I was dead. But look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and to the place of the death. Amen. You know, I, I love this text. It's one of my, my favorites. And, and this is Christ here speaking. Yes. You know, we, we see this is deity himself because only God could make such a statement. I am the first and the last. Such a bold Yeah, statement. I was alive, I was dead, and now I'm alive forevermore. This is someone speaking who has life 
in himself, underived, unborrowed. That's Jesus. Amen. Thank you for Jesus. Central to the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus. Paul made this point very powerful, very powerfully when he wrote, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. We will look at this in more detail next week. Thus, no matter all the emphasis Paul put on Christ's death and how important it was, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It really does not does us no good apart from his resurrection. That's how crucial the resurrection of Jesus is to the entire Christian faith and the plan of salvation. However, it's hard to understand why the resurrection of, Jesus, of Christ and with it our resurrection are so important if, as many believe, the dead in Christ are already enjoying the bliss of heaven as they have gone or home to be with the Lord. All that aside, this week we will look at Christ's resurrection and all the convincing evidence he gave us to believe in it. You know, I, as, as you're reading this, I'm thinking the backdrop of all this is, you know, the Sadducees had lots of power and uh, influence, but they didn't believe in, uh, in, the, in the resurrection. So you, you imagine them um, scrambling when this when this is happening. Well, and we're gonna we're gonna run into that as we go into the lesson that they're scrambling to um, to make up excuses and and all for, uh, for this right. cannot be real. This cannot be real. <laughs> it, well, this was a, a very a powerful uh, event, yeah. and and somebody said, you know, the Sadducees they did not believe in the resurrection, and someone said, no wonder they were sad. You see. So we move over to the sealed tomb. All right. Christ's mission seemed to have ended and even failed with his death on the cross. Satan succeeded in instigating Judas to betray the Savior and the chief priest and elders to, to demand his death. After Jesus was arrested, all the disciples forsook him and fled, and Peter denied him three times. Now Jesus was lying in a tomb hewed out of a rock closed with a large and sealed stone, protected by Roman guards, and watched his invisible demonic power. If he could, he, Satan, would have held Christ locked in the tomb. During his earthly ministry, Christ had foretold not only his death on the cross, but also his resurrection, using the Eastern inclusive language, in which a fraction of a day stands for a whole day. Jesus mentioned that, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the earth, in the heart of the earth. On other occasions, Jesus underscored that he would be killed, but on the third day he would rise again. The chief priests and the Pharisees were aware of those statements and took measures that they hoped would prevent his resurrection. Okay, I got, I got to read something for you to to put all this into perspective, okay? So, um, this is coming from the Desire of Ages, page 778. It says, the priest gave directions for, secure, for securing the sepulcher. A great stone had been placed before the opening. Across this stone, they placed cords, secured the ends to the solid rock, and sealed them with a Roman seal. The stone could not be moved without breaking the seal. A guard of 100 soldiers was then stationed around the sepulchre to prevent it from being tampered with. The priests did all they could to keep Jesus Christ's body where it had been laid. He was sealed as securely in his tomb as if he were to remain there through all time. So, I mean, when, when, I'm, when I'm reading this, I'm saying to myself, well, eventually they came up with the idea that, um, the disciples came and stole the body. And I'm saying, well, how is it that 11 guys or 12 guys can come and, and, um, and overpower 100 people, 100 soldiers? And have all, all to, to the amount of time to break the seal, move the stone away, and, you know, get away with Jesus' body without being detained. It's true. 
so, so Jesus um, told them that he was going to uh, rise on the third day, you know, after he was you know, crucified. And leading up to that event, you know, he spoke more and more with his disciples. But they had this preconceived ideas and they weren't really taking them on, you know. But what had actually happened, I believe that somehow it was the purpose of Satan to keep Christ in the grave. But, but, but somehow the, the high priests and the, the, the elders and the rabbis didn't want to take any chances. So Christ was placed in that tomb. It was sealed. They made sure they had the, the Roman seal on it. They made sure they had cords. They had these guards so that he would not escape. But as the song says, uh, ain't no power on earth can keep him down. Ain't no power on earth. Right. Because one, what, what came to mind with that is that the wages of sin is death. Now, Jesus was a, a sinner. He is sinless. So death had no hold on him because for us who are sinners, that's the payment for our sin. So when you think of Jesus never committing sin and he's sinless and, and the son of God and the creator of life, and that's the reason the death, that death could not hold him. The tomb could not contain him. But you see, you see what happened from the time Jesus was born. Satan tried to kill him from, from, the, very, from the very beginning. And then he used the, the religious leaders to try to kill him. Then he finally, he finally got, uh, got them to convict him and crucify him. And he said, okay, I got him now. I'm going to make sure I seal this tomb so that nobody can get in there. So if he can keep, keep him in there, then if he figured he, he has the victory. Exactly. Because he knew what Christ's resurrection meant. He knew. And if he could hold him in the grave, then ultimately he would have the victory. But then it also questions me. The question that came up is like that. The disciples didn't believe when he kept telling them. But the efforts that were put in to keep Christ in the tomb meant that the Pharisees, and I mean through Satan's evidence, you know, um, edging them on, that they believed the words of Christ. Because when we consider all the attempts that they have made in the past to capture him, and then he evaded them every time. So they would have identified that he had some, or believed that he has some sort of power, so they had, know they had to make that extra effort to contain him. Yeah, so they weren't taking any chances. Exactly. So, so you, you're telling me that uh, it seemed as though the, the religious leaders had believed what Jesus said I, more, I strongly more than believe. The I strongly believe. Yes. And they that's, that's what, that's why, why, I that's strongly why believe that they, that they did. Why would you make those efforts? <laughs> And you see, you see what uh, what wrong teachings can do. It was the, 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 the scribes, the Pharisees. They were the teachers of the day, the rabbis, and they were teaching the people here that this is not the Messiah. When Messiah comes, he will destroy the Roman government. He would set up his kingdom here. He would free us from these Romans, and they believed it. I didn't know Christ came and he was telling them something else, yet still in the back of their heads, they believed that mm, the expectation they had didn't match up. Exactly. You know, and that was for. all because of the teachings that they got. So, wrong doctrine is very dangerous. No matter how sincere we are, it's very dangerous. It's been inculcated in there. And here Christ was telling them, and yet still, because when he was crucified, they were all disillusion, discouraged, ran away, yeah, free. <laughs> so, so you, so you telling me now that um, if if they can, Satan can do this to the disciples who are walking with Jesus mm -hmm. every day, that he will he will just twist us around his little finger. We're no match for the enemy. Uh, we're, we're no match. I, say that. I, I always say that we are no match for the enemy. We think that we are. We think we are something. We think we are strong. That's why we are going to take heed because when we take the standard, then we could fall. So Matthew 27, 62 to 66 says, Now the next day, the day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will arise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, Lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a, a watch. Go your way. Make it sure as you can. 
So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting the watch. Now, we also got to remember that anybody that was put in charge of prisoners, if the prisoner or whatever got away, escaped, uh, escaped or whatever, is their, their, their life. So, so they, they set this thing up from the, from the beginning, even before um, time for Jesus to be resurrected, they set up the story in advance. They tell you, okay, if we're going to secure the sepulcher, but if he happens to, um, to get away, we have this story all made up that um, his disciples came. So all these the reasons, more. Well, I'm convinced that there was some belief in, in their hearts. They that they, they had to be a belief in their hearts that yeah. you know the possibility exists for them that he could get you know escape. Well, I think I think, I think, they, were, I think they were 100 percent sure that he could yeah, escape. Definitely, because they they believe what he said. But the poor disciples. Again, we here we are. You know, always taking things for granted because again, they, like you said, Elder Bob, they're expecting that he was supposed to come in this grand style. And you know, why would you allow yourself to be captured and be crucified if you are the Messiah? If you are powerful, God, this guy that we're looking for. Quite right. Anything else on the on the seal tomb? We know it, it was well well sealed. Yeah, I want my to forget too. Is that the tomb was surrounded by a host of demonic forces? Right. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, they, they, everybody, everybody had the, all the bases covered, you know. But they forgot to say he's the resurrection and the life. So it's like, not only they had a hundred soldiers around the tomb, they had demonic um, forces around the tomb, and I'm sure Satan probably himself was there, making sure that Jesus didn't get out. But Jesus prevailed when he was in heaven. He prevailed here on earth, and he continues to to prevail over Amen. the powers of darkness. Yeah. All right. Let's move over to when the He is risen. All right, He is risen. The victory of Christ over Satan and his evil powers was secured on the cross and confirmed by the empty tomb. When Jesus was laid in the grave, Satan triumphed. He dared to hope that the save that the Savior would not take up his life again. He claimed the Lord's body and sent his guard about the tomb, seeking to hold Christ a prisoner. He was bitterly angry when his angels fled at the approach of the heavenly messenger. When he saw Christ come forth in triumph, he knew that his kingdom would have an end, and that he must finally die. And though Christ's humanity died, his divinity did not die. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. So did, did, did a couple of lessons go, didn't we read about um, Satan contending for the body of yes, um, Moses? Of Moses. <laughs> So obviously he didn't, he didn't learn his lesson. You know, so my thing is always, Satan is very determined. Yeah. He is persistent. So I always try to remind myself and I try to encourage others, the same way he's doing his job and he's persistent, we also have to be determined in you know, being aligning our will with the will of God. Exactly. The last part of that statement from the Isaiah of Jesus that you read there said that when he, Satan, saw Christ come forth in triumph, he knew that his kingdom would have an end and that he must finally die. That is why his efforts, he was determined in his efforts to keep Christ in the tomb. So he was fearful. He was fearful. He knew what resurrection morning meant for him and his angels. He knew. So he just put all his effort. He must not be risen from the tomb. I mean, the, the funny thing is, he, he knows the scriptures better than you and I, so mm -hmm. he, he knew that Christ would, would come out of the, the tomb, but he put all his efforts into, you know, sometimes we, we know something's going to happen, or the Bible says something, but we think that if we take a different course of action, something might change. This is, this is what he probably figured, okay, if I, if I seal him in the tomb and put guards around him and have all my demonic angels watching over him, there, there's no way that he... That he can get out of there. What, what do we tend to say as humans? It ain't over till it's over, right? Yeah. So, so he, he gave it his best shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other part says, and though Christ's humanity died, because some of the people would wonder, how could he die and then be risen? You know, uh, she says that, and though Christ's humanity died, his divinity did not die. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. So remember, Christ had a dual nature. He was the God-man, right? And he just uh, veiled uh, uh, or garbed his divinity 
with humanity. But when his work was finished as dependent man on that resurrection morning, Christ for the first time used his divinity for himself. So divinity did not sink and die. It was humanity that died. So don't ask me how to explain that. <laughs> and the good thing he said, you know, he laid down his life. No, nobody, nobody could take it. Yes. That's what he said. And he, uh, he picked it back up again. So, and only he can do that. Only he can do that. All right. I, what else can we get from uh, from he, from his prison? So during his ministry in, in Samaria, Korea, Jesus stated that he himself had power to lay down his life and take it up again. John 10, 17, and 18. To Martha, he says, I'm the resurrection of the life. Other passages speak of his resurrection as an act of God. Even a mighty angel of the Lord was involved in a glorious event. And um, as, uh, I'm studying, I'm thinking last night, that when when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. And when he's risen, the same thing happened. There was, an, there was a great earthquake when he died. There was a big earth, earthquake when, um, he when he was So just, just imagine for a second that, uh, Power of God, as I just imagine, in, within three days, it, it threw two massive earthquakes, and, and God's earthquakes, you know, are not are not like uh, like the ones that we see. So, I just want to share um, Acts two twenty four. It states, "Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that He should be held by it." Amen. The tomb cannot, could not, and cannot Amen. hold Jesus. And, and we see that, that the three members of the Godhead, they always work in unison. Because when you look at it, um, who raised Christ from the dead? The Father was involved. The Holy Spirit was involved. Jesus himself was involved in his own resurrection. And the angels also had a part. Because when the angels came down with all that glory, and Gabriel himself stood before the tomb and he says, Son, thy father call it thee. Right? The stone was rolled away as a pebble, the wife said. What a scene that was. The Roman guards were strong and they fell as dead. Yeah. Yeah. But, re but remember, they, they, had, they had this story all concocted. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. and, and Jesus came out and he proclaimed, I am the resurrection and the life. This he is risen is our hope. It's our Christian hope. All these men who claim to be God, who claim something where they, they are dead. But the empty tomb is our hope. The song says, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever man is saying. Uh, Matthew 28, 11 to 15 says, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave large sums of large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure him. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. So, why uh, bribery is uh, they, and I'm sure, I'm sure they didn't give him a hundred dollars. He showed up on the other. They, they gave him lots of money to, to spread this story far, far and abroad. And this, I'm, I'm sure they they came and told the chief priest exactly what happened. What happened? I'm sure they told him that uh, somebody, a bright person, came down and uh, hit the, the ground, and the whole earth shook and and the, the stone moved, and, and out comes Jesus, and, and but they saw. Said, they said, "Well, yeah, but yeah, you you saw this, but here's the story we want you to tell. Okay. And we're going to give you a lot of money. And again, as I said before, if um, if they lost the prison or the prison got away, they were all subject to death. But they said, okay, when the governor hears about this, yeah. we're going to we're going to tell them the story, and." Um, so that your life's, your life's spared. spared. Yeah. They could not have been sleeping. That story was filled with so many holes. But they had to concoct something to try to deny the resurrection. 
But the, fa the fact that they themselves, they witnessed it mm -hmm. was a testimony against them also. You know, so that, that they actually witnessed the power and victory of Christ in his resurrection. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm also reminded of the fact that, you know, when before Christ died, with a, when he had a trial, they said, well, it's better that one man perish than, than, we, all, than we all perish. So they, they went to every length to make sure that this one person perished. And all of a sudden, here he is, risen, and they concocted the story. But as we go on, we'll see it was impossible to concoct the story when it helped no with all these uh, witnesses. <laughs> yeah, you know, when, when the woman came to the tomb and they were inquiring, and the angel said that he is not here, for he is risen. What powerful words. Yes. He is not here, for he is risen. Yeah, why do you look for him about the dead? Yeah. <laughs> he told you before, you know, that he's going to die in three days, he's going to take his life up again. So, why are you here? Mm -hmm. Talking about resurrection power. Yes, I'm, I'm jumping around the place, but um, it's, it's pretty much one story. Uh, of course, Mary went to the went to the tomb. And she wanted to uh, prepare Jesus. Well, she wanted to anoint his body, and she she um, well, she was the first one to, to hear about the resurrected sa um, Savior. And then Jesus, Jesus tells her, "Well, go tell his disciples." And of course, the disciples pretty much said. You're crazy. And I'm reminded of the fact that when when Peter was in jail and the people were praying for him and he showed up at the door, they refused to open the door for says, It's not possible. So what does it say about us? What honestly it's it's, it's a question it's a good question. But what does it say about us? Because if we believe in God and we believe in the power of prayer and we believe that God answers prayer. We're praying, we're asked, making all these requests, but when it occurs, we disbelieve. Mm -hmm. and you know, the, the, the thing is that uh, the, the men, that Sunday morning, there wasn't anything about worship and Christ changing the day of worship. That Sunday morning was a time of fear. They were locked up in a room there. Mm -hmm. Don't know what to do. Didn't want to come out mm -hmm. because if they come out, they might too might be crucified. And, and hence the reason that they didn't, they didn't go, go back to the tomb to try to, to rescue Jesus to get him out of the tomb. Exactly. You know, they were they were fearful. You're quite right with that. In spite of all that they heard and all that they knew, they were fearful. But then the, the, the woman, right, two women. the brave woman. <laughs> yes, 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 the brave. <laughs> Yes, a brave ladies, why we were, why we were in the back of cowering and hiding. I, I just had to point that out. <laughs> right, let's see what we can dig out of uh, many a rose with him on Tuesday. All right. They beheld the veil of the temple, th the, sorry, then beheld, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. You, you, you imagine, you imagine that, that scene where these people got about the grave and they go into the city and start talking to people, and, and you knew they were dead. Wait a second, <laughs> you, you've been you've been dead for ten years. Yeah, I attended your funeral. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, and, and, and before we go there, this is, is, is very powerful. When Christ died, the moment that he died, the veil in the temple it was torn from top to bottom. to bottom. And that was a very significant event. You know, it indicated that this was not done by the hand of man. It was done by an unseen hand. It was done by a divine hand. Right? And it indicated that type had met antitype. It meant that shadow had met reality. You know, substance arrived. And uh, it, it, it meant that the Jewish system and all the sacrificial ceremonies had come to an end because Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain for the entire world. Amen. I just want to mention, if you have a question or a comment, just come up to the mic and we will acknowledge you because... We want the ones online to hear what you're saying. So, anyway, so go ahead. So, it says an earthquake marked the death of Jesus, and another 
one marked his resurrection. We already touched with that, and you know, the earth shook, and the rock split, and the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy men, holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of a tomb after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. These saints were raised glorified as witnesses of Christ's own resurrection, as prototypes of those who will be raised in the final, at the final resurrection. Thus, right after the resurrection of Jesus, many of the Jewish people were given powerful evidence to believe in his resurrection and thus to accept him as their savior, which many did, including many priests. So as I, you know, with all this witness, not, not only with Jesus coming up, but people coming out of the graves, I can imagine people coming to the Sadducees and say, wait a second, you've been teaching us that there's no resurrection. So, so that's why I said many people believe um, after they saw the evidence. But it's funny how it's not only that when the people who rose with him when the, when the earthquake, it's the righteous dead. So it wasn't people who died outside of Christ. Right, yes. And I think that it, it went on to, to mention that, that, um, that these people, some of them died again. You know, so, but, uh, but they, were, they were raised up and, and boy, I can, I can imagine the tumult that was in the city with all these dead people running around the place. Yeah, but, um, you know, as a, as a lesson said, that they were prototypes of the resurrection that is to come. They, they were first fruits, right? right? Christ was the first born from the dead, and this was um, taken from the, the Jewish economy, you know, with the agricultural economy, and when the, the crops produced, before they touched or tasted or sold anything, they took the first fruits, you know, to the priest in the temple uh, for the blessings, and uh, saying, this is what is going to come. That's the best taste. This is the best, yeah. Yeah. This is the the best. first fruit, right? And this is what actually happened when Christ arose from the gate. He gave an, an indication of what is going to happen, you know, um, at the resurrection. And because that he arose, many will rise also. So we see here that these people went into the city, and I'm sure that uh, we don't know um, um, how. Some of them had died, you know what I mean? And was it uh, two weeks before the resurrection? We don't know. We don't know if it's people from Noah's time, but some were selected, some patriarchs or somebody was selected. Uh, we don't know. But um, they arose and they went into the city. Here again, we see evidences of Christ's resurrection. Maybe they went to the homes of their relatives and they were talking with them. I know they couldn't tell them. Well, they went to the city, so I, exactly. You know, I think people had a deal, right? And I think it's also proof that it's not, you know, that not just they, it wasn't just Christ. Mm -hmm. So it made it stronger evidence that it's not just this one person who was raised; it's also other people who we knew that was were gone, like you said, whether it's years or days or you know, it doesn't matter. But it's also, it's, like you said, strong proof that those who went to sleep in Christ will be risen. With him incorruptible and reign with him. Yeah, there, there's a, a paragraph that starts with during his ministry. Let's read that. Yes, okay. During his ministry, Christ had raised the dead to life. He had raised the son of the widow of Nain and the ruler's daughter and Lazarus. But these were not clothed with immortality. After they were raised, they were still subject to death. But those who came forth from the grave at Christ's resurrection was, were raised to everlasting life. They ascended with him as trophies of his victory over death and the grave. These went into the city and appeared unto many, declaring, Christ has risen from the dead, and we were risen with him. Thus his immort immortalized, sorry, thus was immortalized the sacred truth of the resurrection. Humanly speaking, the chief priests and, the, and elders had great advantages. They held the religious power of the nation and were even able to convince the Roman authorities and the crowds to help them with their schemes. But they forgot that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Amen. Their lies were co contradicted and invalidated by the existence of those resurrected saints. Yeah. 
So, so they are a little saying that some of the people that Christ raised, they, like Lazarus, the widow son of Nain, and Jairus' daughter, they, went back, they went back to the grave. They died. They were not immortalized. But these people who arose with Christ, they were immortalized. He took them to heaven with him. Why? And we read something to that extent in Ephesians 4.79. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Let's move on to Wednesday, witnesses of risen Christ. The two angels at the tomb told Mary Magdalene and some other women that Jesus had risen. But soon Jesus himself appeared to them, and they worshipped, and, the, and to the two and they worshipped. He appeared also to Peter and to the two disciples on their way to Emmaus, Emmaus, whose hearts were burning while, sorry, I'm okay. Emmaus, whose hearts were burning while he was speaking to them. When Jesus came into the upper room, the disciples were initially terrified and frightened, but they were filled with joy and marveled at what had happened. A week later, Jesus came again into the same room without opening the doors, and then even Thomas believed in his resurrection. During the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus was seen by over 500 brethren at once. And by James, Jesus joined some disciples at the shore of the Sea of Galilee and had breakfast with them, followed by a talk with Peter. There might, there might have been other appearances of Jesus before the final one at his ascension. Paul also con considered himself an eyewitness to the risen Christ, who appeared to one on the road to Damascus. Let's stop there for a second. So, so this is um, so the multi multiple. Multiple, multiple witnesses. Yes. yes. There, there's no way now that they can um, deny. just brush this aside and deny that he was raised. Because not only he was raised, but he appeared to he appeared to 500 people, and I'm sure those 500 people went and spread the word all about all abroad. Exactly. He, he spent 40 days right. on the on the earth after his resurrection. He spent 40 days, and during that time, he appeared to many people. Oh. You know. Um, that's interesting. These two men who were on their way on the yeah, road, yeah. you know, and they were so discouraged and they were so sad when the stranger appeared and asked them, what is happening? And they said, you must have not been from around here or you have heard the news, you know, but um, Jesus then went to talk about himself and certain things, you know, and he tried to you know, disguise himself so they would know. And the thing is that he didn't want to reveal himself. He wanted them to believe his words. So if he had jumped, oh, Jesus, yes, 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 you know. But he reminded them about certain things. It's only later on they realized that it was Jesus who drew near and was walking with them. It's a very interesting story. You know, so, something I gathered, too, from listening to the lesson last night is that, that eventually lots of these disciples, instead of going on spreading the word about Jesus' resurrection, they were they're going back to fishing. And, um, and they, so it's almost like they figure, okay, he's dead now, so let's go back to what um, life is normal. Life is normal. Instead of going out and spreading the spreading the word that Jesus not only came and died, but he was resurrected, etc. I just wanted to mention that the God that we serve, He's such an awesome God, so thoughtful. When Jesus rose, He could have just ascended to heaven to the Father to the throne. But yet he knew what his disciples, what Mary Magdalene, all the others were experiencing, the loneliness, the heart, the pain. And he was like, let me stay here a while. Let me reveal myself to them so that they can have this hope. And that's the same thing how he is with us. He's always giving us hope. He's given us his hope through his word. The Holy Spirit is there to comfort us, comfort us and to guide us. And that's just how he is. He's just a merciful, loving, and caring God. Amen. He's a, he's a very, very patient God because Amen. just imagine these these guys were work, walking with Jesus for three and a half years and, and obviously they didn't, did, nobody gave him the memo. They didn't, didn't realize this is what was going to happen. But he was patient with them and, uh, and even um, even when he had to deal with, with Thomas. Yeah. And Thomas said, all right. Now, now I <laughs> Unless I see the nail prints in your hand and, and uh, the hole in your side. I'm not going to believe. But Jesus patiently enough say, okay, 
there it is. I'm going to show you. You know, so it's like, he's, that's how patient he is with us, you know, with all of our folly. Exactly as the Lord said that uh, he came, he, one of the reasons why he lingered was to give assurance, to give assurance. And, and, and just imagine, it was only after he was with them for three and a half years, and all the things that he was teaching them did not really sink in and really understand. It was only after his resurrection that they began to understand these things with the advent of the Holy Spirit, that they began to understand what Jesus was saying, what was his purpose, what he came for, what is our purpose. It was only then that they really began to understand. In addition to that, before he um, ascended, that was the time that he, he had breathed the um, life into them, the Holy Spirit, so that they can go out and do, that's what you said, Elder Clark, what they were supposed to have been doing even while he was in the tomb. Right. And they stopped doing and went back to fishing and all their, you know, all their worldly affairs. But if he had gone right back to, to heaven, where would the Holy Spirit come in? But now this, this, this brings me back, this brings me to us. Because we, we keep hearing Jesus coming soon and we ought to be um, prepared for him to come, not getting ready. But being ready for him to come, and um, but most of us seem to be fast asleep. And the, the bad thing is, after his resurrection, the disciples still had time to get their minds and their act together. But when Jesus comes, it's going to be too late for us. He's coming so, back for a prepared people. So that's, right. that's that's something we we need to think about. That you know we we need to get our act together. The time that they, the opportunities that they had, <laughs> we're having it now. So we have to act in the now moment. All right. It goes on to say, when the, when the other disciples first told absent Thomas that he had seen the risen Lord, he reacted by saying, unless I see in his hands the prints of the nails, I put my finger into the prints of the nails, I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, Jesus reappeared to the disciples. Now with Thomas present. Jesus said unto him, reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Jesus um, went on to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. Like, like the ladies that went to the tomb. You know, so, <laughs> so I'm like us today too, who have not seen, but Yet we believe. Through the word. And, and Jesus came back especially for Thomas. Yes, a week later he came back. Yes, he came back for Thomas when he was here in person. And he said, you want proof? I'm going to give you proof. So the, the bottom line is, Jesus doesn't want anybody to perish. Amen. He wants to save everybody and he will do his best to make sure that, um, that we have every opportunity to be saved. And um, that's, that's the Jesus that we, that we serve. So, anything else on the witnesses for a risen, a risen Christ? So I could, I could just imagine the, the, the Jewish leaders just shaking in their boots. What, what, what are we going to do now? Yeah, so th that's why we have seen there were overwhelming evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And today there are many people in the world and there's higher criticism and all these things who Christ was not racing, you know, and they have all these uh, funny stories. But we know that we serve a risen Lord. Absolutely. Because as, you know, as, as Paul said that, that if Christ be not risen, then our faith is in vain. You know, everything that we do or preach, everything is in vain. And for, for, for the salvation plan to be crystallized, Christ had to rise from the grave. All right. Let's look at our first fruits of those who have died. All right. The offering of the first fruits was an ancient Israelite agricultural practice with, with a deep religious significance. It was a sac sacred recognition of God, of God as the gracious provider, who had entrusted his stewards with the land where the crops grew and were ready to be harvested. The first fruits indicated that the harvest was not only starting, but also revealing the quality of its products. According to Wayne Grudem, in calling Christ the first fruits, Paul uses a metaphor 
from agriculture to indicate that we will be like Christ. Just as the first fruits or the first taste of the ripening crop show that the rest of the harvest will be like like for that of that of will be like that will be like for that crop. Sorry, read, we'll read that. Just as the first fruits or the first taste of the ripening crop show what the rest of the harvest will be like for that crop. Crop. So Christ also so Christ as a first fruit shows what our resurrection bodies will be like when God finally harvest his risen risen when God finally harvests he rises us raises us from the dead and brings us into his presence yes that I know you get a little kind of thing yes. but it's, you know this, this is it's really um, it's not um, confusing you know but we have faith we must have faith to believe that this is going to be an actuality and this is what Christ wanted to teach uh, by uh, having to raise all his people when he arose from, from the tomb, right? And when when Christ arose from him, his body was a glorified body. It wasn't disembodied spirits. And the people who were raised, they were real people. They went back to their families. They walked around. They had no stories to tell about being somewhere in heaven and then came back down. You know, they arose from sleep. They woke up from their sleep. So, just so God uh, will give us bodies at all resurrection that would please Him, we will not be disembodied spirits. And the Bible said we'll be glorified with Him. Yes, and um, we would know as we are known. We will see people, we remember people. You know, so Christ was uh, the first fruits of them that slept. Okay. It says it is worth remembering that Jesus came out of the grave with a glorified human body. But he, he was still carrying the marks of his crucifixion. Does this mean that the risen children of God will likewise bear the physical marks of their own suffering? In the case of the Apostle Paul, will he still carry in his glorified body the thorn in the flesh and the marks of the Lord, Je Lord Jesus? So, obviously, Jesus wanted, um, Jesus wanted us to know throughout all eternity. This is this is what it costs to save you, you and I. Yes, I just wanted to make a point here that after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me. Also as one of born out of due time. That was Paul. That was Paul, like one born out of due time. And remember, as it says here, for I am the least of the apostles that I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Amen. Uh, that's a very good point, brother, for something that we sort of overlooked here. Because when did Paul, Paul was not an actual disciple like walking with Jesus. Or when did he see Jesus? Remember, he had this dramatic experience with him on the road to Damascus. Heard the voice of God speaking to him. And then he went off into Arabia and spread a prophecy tells us that when he was there, Christ came and spoke to him personally. So he qualified to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and he could claim to have seen Jesus and, and heard him. That's a very good point. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the thought. And um, yeah, there, as I said some people were witnesses to, to Christ's and resurrection and all. And, all. and I, you know, as we look back and see when Jesus appeared to the disciples and the, the doors were locked and all of a sudden he appears, I I can imagine uh, what what they might have gone through. But then again, they they had experiences like that. You know, when uh, when when the storm came and Jesus appeared out of nowhere, so they, they, they knew that Jesus could do that kind of stuff. So. Exactly. But uh, uh, my, my, my biggest concern is that it seemed as though the disciples who were closest to Jesus seemed to, seemed to be, in, in essence, farthest away from him. It's like, almost like they, they, didn't, they didn't get what, what he was telling them. While the, the priests and all seemed to get it, Mary seemed to get it. And, but they, 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 they 
didn't seem to get it. You see, the, the thing is that, um, for instance, case in point, remember the woman with the issue of blood? When she says, when she touched Jesus, she says, somebody touched me. And I said, what's wrong with Jesus? So many people touching at him. Sometimes we could be in close proximity, in church every Sabbath, here and there, but there's no real connection with Jesus Christ. And this that we got to watch, right? Now we know that, that um, at the resurrection, we would be immortalized, this corruptible in corruption, mortal, immortality. So we know that there'd be no, nothing deformed will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus Christ, Spirit of Prophecy tell us, will always retain his human nature. And he will forever bear in his hands you know, the price that was paid for us. He is our brother in eternity. What a sign of also that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Yes. You know, and although he was not the first to be resurrected, it, it's just he is he, because of him, all those things were possible. So he's the first fruit, he's the last, he's everything to us. So without God, we we can we wouldn't exist. Without his resurrection, we won't there would be no resurrection for us. There'll be no salvation. Amen. Amen. Um, I, again, in case someone listening doesn't quite understand what we're talking about. I just want to read the quote here. It says, Until his death, Paul was ever to carry about with him in his body the, the mark of Christ's glory in his eyes, which had been blinded by the heavenly light. And that's from, and then Ellen White, the story of redemption, page 275. But this does not mean that he or any other of the glorified redeemed will be raised with the marks of their own suffering. In in the case of Christ, the marks of this cruelty he will ever bear. Every print of the nails, which tell the story of man's wonderful redemption and the dear price by which he was purchased, his marks are what guarantee us that all of ours will be forever gone. Amen. 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 Uh, li literally, he, he took what was, uh, what was ours and gave us what was what is, what is his. So we're gonna have an immortal body, and all the all the blemishes will be gone. But he will always have the marks in his hand, and his feet, and his side. So I just want to read also before we end uh, Romans 12:1, talking about the first fruit. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and that's for each and every one of us. Is God, God, Jesus sacrificed his life for us. He was the, our, our first fruit. And God is expecting us to give our lives back to him. Amen. Any other thoughts? I have a, some further thought. Uh, a little quote from Desire of Ages, again, page 787. It says, The voice that cried from the cross, It is finished, was heard among the dead. It pierced the walls of sepulchers and summoned the sleepers to arise. This will be this will it be when the voice of Christ shall be heard from heaven. That voice will penetrate the graves and unbar the tombs, and the dead in Christ shall arise. At the Savior's resurrection, a few graves will open, but at his second coming, all the precious dead shall hear his voice and shall come forth to glorious immortal life. The same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise his church and glorify it with him. Above all principalities, above all powers, above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Amen. And, um, and, and the thing is, Jesus' voice will raise every every living scene. And can you imagine from from Adam all the way down to this time? Amen. All the saints will be raised up all at once. There, there are two um, sets of um, brief words. There's only three words that were uttered by the angel and by uh, by Christ Himself when He said, "It is finished." That brings joy to our heart. Salvation plan was complete. Satan was forever defeated, and we can be assured of victory. The another three words: He is risen. That was a star of hope that, that kept this um, hope in the hearts of disciples burning. When they went forth with the word, they preached of a risen Christ and a soon coming king. And this should be the hope uh, 
our hope that should keep us alive spiritually, energize us as we live in this world down here below. Amen, amen. Any final thoughts about um, this lesson? Jesus' resurrection marked the final victory over sin and death. May God continue to be with us. We continue to keep us and help us to remember that we must not only be in close proximity with Jesus, but we must learn of him. We must have faith in him. And we must be rooted and grounded in the truth of God's word so that we shall not be deceived by the enemy or any sort of false teaching that God's word does not support. Remember the story of the disciples. They were closest to Jesus, but they seemed as though they, didn't, they were farthest away because they didn't seem to get what he was talking about. But praise God, after they realized that he, is, he was resurrected, they became powerful witnesses and powerful uh, ministers of the gospel, spread his gospel to all the world. Amen. May God bless us as we continue our journey today. And you know, We don't want you to go anywhere. We just ask you to hang to continue to watch our channel. We're having a wonderful sermon for you, music, etc. And we pray that as we continue to worship the Lord today, that we will continue to worship Him in the beauty of holiness. And I'm glad all everybody is well. I see lots of you here today. So all of us got through the storm pretty much okay or with minor damage. And God's blessings be with you. Elder Bob, just pray for us today. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the study of your word. We are indeed grateful, dear Father. Our hearts are overflowing with joy because you are not dead. You are risen and that you are coming back again. May this hope continue to fill our hearts and, and buoy all our footsteps as we live in this, on this earth. These mercies I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
have to work hard to get food to eat, God said, for you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Then God made them clothing from the animals, but God knew that Adam and Eve could no longer live in the garden because of their sin, so he sent them away and closed up the garden. Becky was sick for seven years. She suffered from swollen hands and legs, and even spent some time recovering in the intensive care unit. But her health was transformed when she attended a lifestyle program run by Adventist. She made changes that had an almost immediate effect. Her symptoms were gone within a few weeks. For the first time in a while, her hands and legs were no longer swollen. Now she is an advocate who helps others on their health journeys. Diabetes is the leading cause of death in the Pacific region, and the rate of diabetes deaths in the Pacific region is one of the highest in the world. The Pacific Islands are known for their fertile land, nutritious fruits and vegetables, as well as their traditional knowledge and practice of planting and preparing food. Yet lifestyle diseases have increased at an alarming rate. If not detected and treated early, Diabetes can lead to heart attack, stroke, kidney problems, and disabilities. Through partnership with communities and a holistic approach, the 10,000 Toes Campaign is helping people turn the tide on diabetes in the South Pacific. Thanks in part to your contribution to the 13 Sabbath offering in 2019 that helped propel this initiative. The 10,000 Toes Campaign is an exciting initiative of Aventus Health in the South Pacific Division that trains ambassadors to go and deliver whole person health to not just those who live in the cities, but also expanding into new territories and remote villages through its fleet of mobile wellness hubs. This campaign is currently working in multiple countries, including the Solomon Islands, as a church that's involved in health as, a, as an important part of its mission, we are very happy that we can use the 10,000 toes strategy to connect with the communities. And so the 10,000 toes strategy is an important uh, part of our mission work. We will be doing a great work, breakthrough places that we were not able to the 10,000 toes strategy, and that's, that's very important to, to us. Uh, uh, the so, yeah, thank you, thank you for the support. The program has a three-part strategy focus. First, to detect diabetes through health screenings. Second, resourcing lifestyle coaches so that churches and village halls become wellness hubs in the communities. And third, enhancing the capacity of health professionals in lifestyle medicine. Many people have been so impacted by their experience that they want to become ambassadors and help others. Despite having willing participants, the pandemic has slowed training in some areas. So far in the Solomons, our health department has recruited around 900 ambassadors. And over the last two years, we have been able to train uh, only about 150. And so we need to continue with the training so that the, our ambassadors can go to the villages and, and do the screening and, and bring the data to us so that we can plan, uh, you know, what we, are, what we can do to help um, educate and also um, en enable the, the people to be able to, to have more ability to look after themselves. Ambassadors in Fiji took to the streets in one of the busiest suburbs. With the approval of a major supermarket, they set up outside to interact with customers and staff. Many were intrigued with the health screening results. These ambassadors have been well trained and are prepared to follow up with each person with a plan of action. The campaign dreams of turning the tide on diabetes and taking people on a journey to whole person health by having 10,000 ambassadors working in 400 wellness hubs across the South Pacific by the end of 2025. With the help of donations from the 13th Sabbath Mission Offering, we've been able to progress wider and deeper. And for this, we want to express our deep gratitude 
to the General Conference and the Worldwide Church. While there is still much to do, the 10,000 Toes campaign continues to transform lives throughout the South Pacific. Please pray that more hearts will be touched as a result of the compassion shown by the Adventist Church. Thank you for supporting 13 Sabbath offering projects like this. Your contributions make a difference.
morning and happy Sabbath, church. Oh, that was a couple of people. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Are you happy that it is the Sabbath? A day of rest. No matter what happened this week, it's the Sabbath. It's rest time. Are you happy about it? Are you glad about it? Amen, amen, amen. Well, we want to welcome you to Mount Zion Seventh-day Adventist Church. And whether you are joining us in person or virtually, we just want to say a warm welcome to you. And if you have social media, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, we invite you to like and subscribe at MT Zion SDA. MT Zion SDA. Um, our current goal is 500 subscribers on YouTube. We are at 499. 499. We were supposed to be at 500 last week, but one person needs to get us to 500, and if not beyond. So if you can help us out, go to MT Zion SDA on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe and get us to 500 and beyond. I know we can do it by the end of today. If you haven't already online, go ahead and tell us where you are watching from so we can go ahead and greet you. But do we have any first-time visitors here in the house this morning? Anybody that's your first time here? Everybody's been here. Okay. Well, welcome back home, everybody. Welcome back home. Good morning to Vivia Lawson, who is online on YouTube right now. Good morning, Mount Zion. We serve a risen Savior. Thank God for his mercy. We're still alive and well. Then we have Grafonda Dunham. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, Elnora Ali said, good morning, happy Sabbath from Umatilla, Florida. Then we have Vivia Lawson. She says hallelujah and claps her hands. So good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you this morning. So a couple of things that we want to do is the first thing is we need to greet everybody. We need to greet everybody. So I invite you to stand up. Make sure that you say good morning. Any, just go ahead, greet someone that you haven't already seen this morning. Make sure they feel that Mount Zion welcome this morning. and warm after that, that you saw someone that you haven't seen this morning yet. Amen, amen. All right, so we have uh, a couple of things. So first, I was on Facebook this morning, and you know Facebook will tell you when birthdays are. So yesterday, of course, was my dad's birthday, so that was yesterday. But then also two of our f former first ladies' birthdays, uh, Sister Williams and also Sister Parham's birthday was yesterday as well. So we had a lot of birthdays yesterday. But then Facebook is telling me between yesterday and today, Sister Morgan, you have two profiles. So I don't know which one to believe. One says your birthday was yesterday and one says it's today. So which one is it? You don't know. Pick one. Okay. Well, we're going to... Is none of them? Okay, your birthday's in March. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, not happy birthday to you, but we see happy birthday to Sister Ruby Cupid. It's her birthday today, so if you have her number, make sure you go ahead and say happy birthday to her. You got to 
check on your account system, Morgan. I don't know. <laughs> but we have a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, Elder Bob, Michael Bob, is our speaker this morning. Amen, amen. So he will be presenting the word to us this morning. Today, the Oaks of Kissimmee is the nursing home that will be visited at 3 p.m. So if you want to join for the nursing home visit, it is at 3 p.m. A vaccination card is required for nursing home visits. All right, so I'm not sure it's if, if it's every single nursing home that's going to be visited by this church, but um, a couple of them have made it required. So it is a good idea to walk with your vaccination card if you plan on visiting. Uh, after that, Bible study will continue at 4 p.m. Did you all enjoy it last week? Amen. All right. So again, it is 4 p.m. today. Bible study. Come back at 4 p.m. for that. There's also a board meeting on Monday at 7.30. So board members, look out for the Zoom link. It will be coming uh, via email or text. So make sure that you send your agenda items in advance. Um, for those that are interested on November 14th, which is a Monday at 8 p.m., the, there is a Central Florida Black Nurses Association of Orlando cardi, cardiovascular health discussion, and this will also earn you one CEU credit. If you need credits, this will give you a credit, um, but at 8 p.m., it's an hour. It's a Zoom uh, event, so the Zoom number is 954-0808. 7016. So the good thing about recording online is if you didn't get the number just now, you can go back and get the number, all right? So you will earn a one CEU uh, credit if you need that, but they're going to explain a lot of uh, details about cardiovascular health. And then I have an announcement from the conference office to share with you all. So it says, greetings, I'm sending an official letter detailing the installation of Pastor Ron Smith II into Mount Zion Seventh-day Adventist Church in Kissimmee, Florida. This will be on December 10th during divine service. He will be here no later than 1045 that day. Pastor Olinto Gross will be leading out in the installation. So our new pastor, Pastor Ron Smith II, will be here December 10th uh, during the main worship service. I want to ask a question this morning. What is something you learned or were reminded of this week? What is something, think of like a, a life lesson or a spiritual lesson. What is something that you were even either reminded of that you may have known, but you forgot or it was a good reminder or something that you learned this week that you never uh, heard before? I want you to take a little bit to think about that. And if I have a one or two volunteers to kind of tell me something. You don't want to keep that thing to yourself because it could bless somebody else. So what is that one thing that you learned or were reminded of this week? I have a hand. Okay. We need to, you know, when we say we're going to do stuff, do it. Right, right. Sometimes when you have that feeling, you just need to act on that feeling. You never know why you have that. But I'm sorry for your loss. I know that a loss is never easy. So definitely a lesson learned there. Anything else? What's something that you were reminded of or learned this week? Oh, Brother Hunt up there. Somebody's going to have to translate for me. All right. Life is precious. It's the little things, right? Life is precious. Life is precious. Is there anybody else? Is there somebody on online that I miss? I've learned that even when things get really rough, don't give up. Continue trusting in God. Even when things get rough, don't give up. Continue trusting in God. I'm going to share one this week. This week, for some reason, I listen to a lot of different messages on my drive to work. Uh, and there's one that I was like, wow, this was really, really good. And I'm going to share a part of it with you. And if you're so curious about the message that you want to listen to it later, just ask me and I'll send it to you. 
Everybody knows the story of Job, or most people know the story of Job, right? And there's one scripture that this preacher shared that I never paid attention to when it comes to this story. And you know that God, the devil went up and he asked God, um, you know, some questions. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? So God offered up Job's name to the devil, right? And Satan responds with, does Job fear God for nothing? So Satan is basically saying, of course Job is committed. Look at how you blessed him. Satan further questions and said, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? But this draws the question. God never said to Satan that he put a hedge around Job. Satan says this to God. If God didn't say this to Satan, how does Satan know this? It must mean that Satan must have tried to get to Job and he couldn't get through because there was a hedge protecting him. And since he had tried before and he had failed, that means that even when God offered up Job's name, Satan said, I've been there before and it didn't work. And so somebody needs to know we all go through adversity, but every now and then we ought to take a moment and thank God for what we didn't go through because there's a hedge of protection around you. So there's been some sicknesses that have been blocked. Even though you are sick or have been sick, guess what? You didn't get every sickness that was supposed to come to you. There was a hedge around you. There's been some doors that have been closed that you have no idea. There's certain things that God blocked. There's some accidents that he's prevented. There's some pitfalls that were avoided because you have a hedge of protection around you. And so sometimes it's important not to just focus on what you're experiencing at this present moment. Not that it's not bad. You're experiencing some heartache, some pain, but sometimes you just need to give glory to God for what he didn't allow to get through because the devil tried and God said no. And I think that's a powerful, powerful, powerful thing to remember as you're going through life. Is there anybody this morning that stands in the need of prayer? Always, always. Well, will you join me in standing as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning? I know a lot of us might have prayer requests, but we're going to go ahead and take it to the throne in prayer. Dear Jesus, we want to just thank you this morning for life, health, and strength. Thank you for being above and beyond everything we could have ever asked or expected. God, you major in the minors and the majors, and so if it's a concern to us, it's a concern to you. So we want to just thank you for being a God that just loves us and cares. Thank you for loving us like no other person could love us. There's people that love us for what we can do for them. There's people that uh, love us for what they've experienced of us. But they don't know everything about us, but there's a certain type of love that you have that you know every single thing, our darkest secrets, our greatest triumphs, you know everything about us and still love us. And so we want to just thank you for that type of love that you bestow upon us. Thank you for each and every single person, either here in person or logged in. You know everything they stand in need of. I pray that you... um, Take heed to their prayer request this morning. Give them the comfort of if they're in a place where they need you, but they have to wait for a little bit. Give them the peace in the waiting season for those things that you can give a yes to immediately. Give them the comfort in the victory that's about to be theirs. And for those things that you say no to, give them the understanding that there's certain things that you don't allow because you have better for them. So whatever situation we stand in need of, whether it's a yes, no, or a maybe, help us be comforted in knowing that you have us and there's a hedge of protection around us. I pray that uh, whether it's financial, whether it's school, whether it's work, whether it's family, whether it's friends, whatever we need, that you be there and uh, providing the wisdom that we need for every situation and season. As we've gathered to worship, help us to worship in spirit and truth. Uh, be with our praise and worship leader. Be with our speaker, Pastor, or Elder Bob, this morning. May he speak words that will give life unto us. As we transition into a new season of getting a new pastor, help us to be prepared um, for this new leadership transition. May Um, His leadership be blessed and be exactly what this church needs in this season. We know that all things through you are possible. So help us to stay 
um, and put our trust in you at this time and always. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Worship today in spirit and in truth. Zachary Pascal was born on November 12th, 2022. So, October. Why did I put it on the 11th? I guess today is, look at you, 12th. I'm saying he's born to today, <laughs> June 1st, 2022. Now, as Pastor normally does, I went looking to see what um, the name Zachary meant. And it says it's a shorter version. Of the word Zechariah. And as a Hebrew word, that means God remembers. Okay, so little Zachary has the name of God remembers. God will remember his, his birth. God will remember everything that, uh, that Zachary does during his life. And hopefully, God will remember Zachary when he comes in his, his kingdom. We just want to remind our, our parents that, um, that this is the most important word that you have in this one, in this life. We're raising little Zachary, and I know you have three others, three other kids. So, so this is a, this is a big job, especially in this world today. Every, there's so much corruption, there's so much um, evil, so many things happen in this world, that Zachary is going to need you like never before. So, Mom, you know that um, Zachary will look to you as the first Jesus that he ever knew. You're going to be the one that teaches Zachary all his life lessons and you know there's some things that dad will will teach Zachary also. Zachary will learn from dad to be strong and to be a provider and etc. But mom has the first word and mom has the first say and mom will be there to um, to nurture Zachary. And I know that God has has um, given you the strength to raise Zachary. It's not that case, but I, I, I have to say to you anyway that the spirit that is in your home will be transferred to your child. If it's a spirit of love and peace and togetherness, that's what Zachary will see. If it's a um, spirit of contention, etc., that's what Zachary will see. So we want Zachary to grow with the best possible chance of making it into the kingdom. And finally, I want you to know that Zachary is a gift of God from God, and you need to we need to raise him in the way that God would expect him to, to be raised. I know um, I know Dad is going to bring Zachary to church, but I I would like to see all of you come with Zachary. I'm, I'm hoping that Zachary will lead all of you to to the foot of the cross. So just remember that he's a he's a gift from God, and when Jesus comes, he's going to ask you what happened to little Zachary. Other kids, all your other kids. So. 
church. Whenever you have an opportunity, I know that you will give the parents a helping hand and help them to raise Zachary. Sometimes Zachary will be, might be in church crying, and he just needs someone to take him from the parents and uh, just watch over him for a couple of minutes. Okay, so is, is Zachary um, to be held by outsiders? <laughs> if not, that's okay. bow our heads. Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise for little Zachary. Lord, his name means God remembers, and God, we know that you will remember little Zachary. We pray, Lord, that you will bless him with health, bless him with strength, bless him, Lord, as he grows from this, this age all the way through adulthood, and Lord, that you will watch over him every step of the way. Pray, Lord, that you will continue to be with him, bless him and keep him. And above all, Lord, we pray that as he grows, that he will get to look to know you as Lord and Savior of his life. Be with the parents. We pray, Lord, that you will give him the wherewithal, the means, the financial means, the spiritual needs and physical needs, dear Father, to raise Zachary in a way that is pleasing and good in your sight. Pray, Lord, that you will continue to be with them in a marked and mighty way. And, Lord, as we have said in our church, whatever we can do to help little Zachary, that we will be only happy to do. Pray, Lord, again, that you will be with them in a marked and mighty way. And you will continue to bless him and keep him. And, Lord, above all, we pray, Lord, that you will put a hedge about him with all the evils that are in the world. And we pray that he will grow up to be a young man man that is pleasing in your sight. Be with us now as we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Zachary. Thanks. We get for you. that the Lord saved me. Is anybody thankful that he saved me, that he picked you up, that he turned your life around? Hallelujah.
Yes. 
morning family. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless his holy name. I want to thank God for his love and for his mercy. I want to welcome you in the house of God this morning. You are alive and well. You could have been somewhere else, but you are here to listen to God's word and just to bless his holy name. I want to thank you, uh, Mom Zion family. Uh, from the first time I stepped through those doors, I felt your warm embrace. And I want to thank the elders. I thank the elders for their rapid accommodation of a humble brother, especially uh, the Leclerc, such a humble man. Give God and glory to him. And especially our former pastor, Pastor Alex Williams for his messages of hope and for being my mentor beyond the scenes or behind the scenes. I just thank God to be here this morning and to be able to do whatever he has placed within my heart to bless you on this morning. Uh, we live in perilous times, as you know, friends. Days that we are not to take for granted because the enemy knows that he has but a short time he has great wrath against God's people. You know, when God delivered the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage, they got to Mount Sinai. That's a few, wasn't too long afterwards. God called Moses up into the mount to give him some instructions for these traveling, just ransom release slaves. He was up in the mount communing with God. And the people at the base of the Mount Sinai, they found that Moses was taking too long to come down. They were saying that Moses delayed his coming. We want a God, Aaron. We want a God that we can see. And their minds went back to Egypt. So Aaron, instead of standing up like a man of God, as a soldier for God, he towered, he conceded to the whims of the congregation, and he erected a molten calf. The Bible says sadly that the people sat down. When, when he erected the molten calf, he said that this is your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Bible says that when they sat down and they, they worshipped this calf, they sat down to eat and to drink. And notice the words that followed, they rose up to play. They rose up to play. I want to tell you, Mount Zion family, that this is no time to play. Because our salvation is nearer than when we believe. Everything in our world points to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Everything. You listen to the news. You read what is happening on a daily basis in our country. This is no time to play. No time to play hopscotch with your salvation. No time to play in the river on the bank with your salvation. But we must say God and mean God because this is not a joke. Serving God is serious business because eternity and your salvation is at 
mistake. I have watched, I love to watch marathons, sprints. And one thing I'm always amazed with, after they have run maybe 25 miles, and they are approaching the finish line, you would think that you would become tired and just fall by the way. But there's something about that tape at the finish line that seems to give them an extra oomph. When that finish line is in sight, it doesn't matter how tired they are. They get an extra burst of energy just to burst the tape. We cannot turn back now. Those of us who have been serving God for so long and our young people who are in our church, we cannot turn back now. It is too late to turn back. It is too late to take the wrong road. Because sometimes we may not have the opportunity to make a roundabout turn. Because life Paul heads as we pray. Father in heaven, use your servant today. This piece of clay. Touch some heart as a result of your word, I pray. Amen. Amen. As you look around, world today, as I said, as you see the climate that is in our society, where evil is taken for good, and good is taken for evil. There was a time when this book, people ran to this book for answers to their questions. There was a time when people used to want to live according to this book. But now every man seems to be doing his own thing. If God says go left, we are going right. If God says black, they are saying white. And listening to God's word seems to have become a thing of the past because every man seems to be doing what is right in his own eyes. In the political arena, there is crisis. We should keep our eyes there also. Because what is happening in this country, we see that democracy is being challenged. That means that the, the way is going to be open set for the mark of the beast. We look at the home life. It's in chaos. We look at the church life. chaos. You will agree with me that we are living on the threshold of eternity, right on the borders of the heavenly Canaan. And when, where the, the Israelites found their most stern challenges were right when they were knocking on the door of the heavenly Canaan. As the Satan intensified his attacks, and his attacks would be in, I, in, intensified against you also. I am not a prophet, but I know that we are all dealing with something, some issues in our life that we are dealing with. It is the enemy's ploy, it is his plan to keep you detracted, to set you off course, to create detours in your life on your way to Jesus Christ. So we must be intentional about our salvation. Not to be caught up with the, the things of the world, with the fashions, money, prestige. Everything else must sink into oblivion when we think about Jesus Christ and our soul salvation. We are called to be watchmen on the walls of Zion. Our 
friends, especially those who stand in our pulpit, they're supposed to be watchmen on the walls of Zion, who have an understanding of the times. I'll be able to speak to God's people and thus said to Lord. Not like Aaron. He cowered to the winds. He conceded to the fancies of, of the congregation when they were asking for stuff that was not in harmony with God's will. And he refused. Big preaching is not a popularity contest. When a man stands between the porch and the altar, spare my people, O oh Lord. It's not a popularity contest. No place for, for jokes. It's too late for that, my friends. God has raised up his church for such a time as this. God has called us to preach his message about the kingdom of grace that we are living in. You know, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, we have the gospel commission. It says, Christ says, go ye therefore and do what? Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. This is why we exist as a church. This is why God has called you. This is why he has called me into a service. In the book, Acts of the Apostles, page 9 and paragraph 1, this is what the Lord said. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service. The church was organized for service. And its mission is to carry the gospel to all the world. The church has been organized for service. And its mission is to carry the gospel to all the world. We are called and commissioned to give the world, give a message to our neighbors, our family, our friends, and our co-workers. Everything that we do must be in reference to the second coming of Christ. We are called to give this last message of mercy to the world. It is a message of love, a message of Jesus. It is a message of righteousness by faith that is found in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, represented by three angels flying in the midst of heaven. That begins, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. It's not really an angel, but an angel is you. That angel is me flying in the midst of heaven. Having what? An everlasting gospel. Not a new gospel. Not some strange gospel. But an everlasting gospel. The gospel that was there before, that is now and will continue until Jesus comes. Which is the good news that Jesus Christ died. To provide grace for sin, which is a transgression of God's law. To preach to all of them that dwell upon the face of the earth. And verse 7 says, saying with a loud voice. Now, we cannot afford to be quiet. We cannot afford to be quiet. Some soul may be lost. And all souls may be lost. I've seen people in my daily walks of life. I've seen people as I interact with people on my job. They are proud to declare who they are. They have it printed out there on their t-shirts. And they are walking proud and sometimes holding hands. Enough said. They are proud. Very proud. To display their colors. What is your color? Are you displaying your color? The Apostle Paul says, Romans 1, I think, or 16, he says that, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because what? 
It is the power of God unto salvation. Never be ashamed of what you believe or to declare who you are. It doesn't matter where you are, where you go. You go for a job from the in, from the, the, the inception. Let them know I'm not working on Sabbath. Don't be ashamed or afraid to declare I am a child of the king. I heard a, a guy say one time, um, I don't care. I make a jail and I could make it again. He was proud that he was in jail. He was proud. We need to be proud of who we are. We are children of the king. And we are living according to a high and a holy standard. We cannot lower the bar to meet our expectations or other people's expectations. But we must leave the bar where it is or if we raise it higher and help people to come up to the bar. Fear God, the angel says, and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is come. Listen, family, church of Laodicea, I want to remind you that we are living in the judgment hour. Now is not the time to play. Satan is on the war path. He wants you. He wants you, young people. He wants you, elderly folk. Jesus had to turn to Peter and said one time, to him, Look, Peter, the devil desired to have you, to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. The enemy wants to sift us. He wants to take control of you. He wants to destroy our faith in God. You want to chew us up and spin us out and then stamp on us. But I thank God for Jesus Christ this morning and his grace. No matter what happens to me, no matter what I'm going through, my desire is to serve the Lord until I die or he comes because I know where I've been. I know where God has brought me from. And I can declare to you this morning as Paul, I am who I am by the grace of God. Not what I know, not what I own, not what I possess, no intellectual ability, no money in the bank, but I am here today by the grace of God. Troubles are going to come. Trials will come. But we can't give up. <laughs> we just can't give up. But we need to hold on to Jesus Christ. All these past and fancies, all these pleasures, all these things that are going on taking place, it's the devil desire to detract us from the word of God. Everything that's going on. But we need to be intentional about our salvation to realize that these things are transitory. That these things are going to pass. But only what is done for Jesus will last. Sometimes young people think that they are too young to die. <laughs> I'm going to live. I'm only 20. I could have some fun. When I get about 50 or so, I could turn my life over to the Lord. This church thing for me is too boring, you know. And they get themselves mixed up with stuff. But it's hard to come out. It's like playing in cement when it's wet. Stand there for a while and when you want to get out, you can't move. Because it's gotten hard. It takes the work of grace and the Holy Spirit to chisel you out. And I'm thankful that I got to know the Lord as a young man. Had no baby mamas, nothing on the outside, all this stuff going on, you know. Never been to jail only because of 
the grace of the Lord. And now, now that I'm reached to this age and stage, I, I would not find myself there. That would not be wise. I've come too far to turn back now. Too far to turn back now. What God has done for me, what, my greatest joy is serving God in spirit and in truth. That's my joy. There's joy in serving Jesus. There's joy in the Lord. I want to say something to you, friends, especially to our young people. When you look at your life now and where you are, it takes a second to make a mistake that you would regret for the rest of your life. One second. And you cannot go back and undo it. You cannot turn back the hands of time. But you got a prayer to ask God just to keep me. There's nothing wrong with serving Jesus. There's joy in serving Jesus. We are living in the judgment hour where cases are being decided for eternity. But I want to bring it home now. We have talked about the, the world. We have talked about the expectations. We have talked about what is happening. Talk about preaching the gospel to the world. But, 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 I want to say to you today, and these are some words that a friend of mine always uses. The same gospel that we preach for the salvation of souls must be the same gospel by which our own souls are saved. Because like Paul, we don't want to be preaching. We don't want to be praising. We don't want to be praying. And when that day come, our souls are lost. He was concerned that even though he was in Christ, he did not want to be a castaway at the end of the day. And that should be our concern. Because we do not believe in one saved, always saved. Salvation is not an event. It's a progression with Christ. We're going to keep praying. We're going to keep witnessing. We're going to keep studying. Or else we may find ourselves on the outside. This same gospel that we preach for the saving of souls must be the same gospel by which your own soul is saved. In other words, family, as we prepare and point others to Christ, we must not neglect our own personal salvation. Yes, I know you have to work. I know you have to get up early in the morning. I know you're going to take care of the children. I know you have bills to pay. I know you have to go to school, do your homework. But Christ must not be put on the back burner. I know you want to get married. I know you want to drive a new car. I know you want to get a house. But Christ must be put on the top of the list. Because in the event, in our pursuit of these things, we could lose our very lives. Important though they be. We must be ready for the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We must be living in a state of constant readiness. And this is so important, I have to say it again. We must be living in a state of constant readiness. Living a life in total obedience, total harmony to God's will and to his way. I want to say something, friends. Maybe you have never heard it before from the pulpit. I don't know. But do not believe those who would tell you that you cannot have perfection of character in this life. Do not believe those who would tell you that you cannot have perfection of character in this life. This may seem strange, but you might even hear it from the pulpit. Do not believe it, even if it's being preached from our pulpits. That is Satan claim. He proclaimed that man cannot live according to the law of God. God has given man a law which he cannot keep. But that is a lie from the pit of hell itself. I stand here.
I repeat, we can live above sin. Paul says in Romans 6.14, Romans 6.14, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under what? Grace. Sin shall not have dominion over you, using us like a puppet. One day we are up, the next day we are down. We are steeped in some sin and we can't, since 1844, and we can't seem to shake it. Sin shall not have dominion over you. And we need to stop using the words like, I'm only human. That's a cop out. I am only human. There is power that is available to keep us from sinning. Because if it is not, Jesus has to go back to the drawing board and to rework some things. Because he came to save us from our, not in, but from our sins. We can be overcomers. Christ came, according to Romans 3, 4. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. Christ came to crucify sin in the flesh. Christ came to crucify sin in the flesh. We can overcome temptations. I want us to read this familiar text, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation. Listen to this, friends and family. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Maybe the same things that you are dealing with, I am dealing with it too. We are all human beings and we are all in the same boat. Today for me, tomorrow for you. What I'm dealing with today, you may be, you have to deal with it on tomorrow. But God, I love the buts. But God is faithful. Now look, look at the words we will follow. Who will not allow you to be tempted more than you are able? God knows just how much to give you. He knows how much you can bear. The story is told of a man who is always complaining about how things are so hard. Everybody he meets. I will tell you something, friends, that sometimes we just need to stop complaining all the time and talk about God's goodness, his love, his mercy, his providence, and his compassion. He was always complaining. How oh, this cross is too heavy. This cross is too heavy. So one night he had a dream. And the dream he was passing this building. And on the sign, a, a sign outside the building said, crosses for sale. So he said, oh my goodness. So he went in the building with his cross. And he put it down in a corner. And he tried this cross. It was too heavy. He tried another cross. It was too tall. He tried another cross. It was too light. He tried another cross. It was too rough. Then he picked up one cross, put it on his foot, and said, Ah, this one is just good. And when he reached outside, it was his own cross. God knows just how much you can bear. And if we would put all our problems on a line, you would take yours, and I would take mine. He, he knows everything just sifts through his fingers before it gets to you. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. And listen to this, he's not finished yet. But with the temptation, what he's going to do? Make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That is why there is no excuse for sin. Lord, I did this because. There's no excuse for sin. Because God knows how much you can bear. And I, I have taken that and I have placed that in a secret place in my heart. 
Lord, I'm dealing with a situation. It seems to be overwhelming. Lord, it's, it's burdensome. I can't seem to hold on. I'm going to give in, Lord. I'm going to give in to the temptation. No, you are able to bear it. I know you. I made you. Allow this to come to you because you can bear it. Regardless of what it is, you can bear it. We can obtain victory. We can have characters that heaven can put a stamp of approval on. We can obtain victory over sin and self. This is not a mission impossible. This can be accomplished all because of the marvelous grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at this mighty power of grace for a few moments. And then we'll close. What is grace? If I ask you a question, what is grace? I know what is going through. Some of your minds right now is unmerited favor. <laughs> yeah. I can't read your mind. <laughs> unmerited favor. Yeah. You know, I said it's a precious gift from God. But you would be right. Ephesians 2 8. What does Ephesians 2 8 say? For by what? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourself. It is what? It is a gift of God. And we are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God. Not of yourself, the text says. Because we can do nothing to effect our own salvation. There are only two things that we can do without Jesus Christ. One is sin. And two, sin again. We can do nothing to effect our salvation. We are saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. Man needs a power outside of himself and above himself in order to walk the way that Jesus wants him to walk. It is a gift of God. This any should boast. Grace is a gift of God. Something that we do not deserve something that we did not and cannot work for. Allow me to pause here to proclaim that grace is not a New Testament phenomenon. Grace it is not. This is especially for our friends down the street. They say, but grace is not a New Testament thing. Grace existed in the heart and mind of God before the creation of our world. We have an indication of that in Genesis 3.15. After man sinned and God said what? I will put enmity. From the moment man sinned, grace sprang into action. From the moment he sinned, there was a savior. Man shall have a second chance. All because of the grace of God. As soon as man sinned, grace was promised. He shall have another chance. In Genesis 6, 8, the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace came personified in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What is grace? Sister so White said it very clearly in the book, Ministry of Healing, page 161. She says, grace is an attribute of God. It's all good. Unmerited favor is a gift. Yes. She goes on to say, grace is an attribute of God. It means it is a quality. It is a characteristic of God. Exercise towards undeserving human beings. We do not deserve the grace of God. We do not deserve the grace of God. But look what she says following. And I love this. We did not seek for it. But it was sent in search of us. We did not seek for grace. But grace was sent in search of us. I love it. My mind goes back to the Garden of Eden when they sinned and God came looking. You know, that's what sin does. 
causes us to run away from God, when we should be running to God, who is our only help. Sin causes us to run away and hide from God. But God comes looking. God comes. Christ came to Adam and Eve in the garden and he asked the question, where art thou? Grace comes looking. In our sinful state, we did not go in search of grace, but grace came in search of us. Where you were, what you did, where you have been, it doesn't matter to grace, but grace comes in search. But thank God for grace. Romans 5, it says that while we were yet sinners, isn't that something? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were doing our own thing, while we were turning our backs, we were partying, doing all manner of stuff, but grace came in search of us. Sin has the power, sin has the power to take us where we do not want to go and keep us there longer than we want to stay. I want to say to you, friends, if you see you're walking down the street and you see sin coming, run to the other side. Do not dabble. Don't create an invitation. Because sin is progressive. One step, that's all it takes. Sin is progressive. And you will find yourself in a place where it's difficult to untie yourself. You become tied up in knots of the enemy. You become holden with the cords of your own sin. And there are people today who are longing, who are hoping for a way of escape. It might be in, in, in the form of drug addiction. It might be in the form of, 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 of fornication. It might be a, a, adultery. But they are longing to get out. But they are so steeped in it. But for the grace of God. But grace, in spite of what we have done, grace comes in search of us. It doesn't matter where you have, what you have done. How far you have gone, where you have been, there is a way. There is a way. Grace comes breaking down barriers of sin. Grace comes breaking chains that hold us captive to demonic forces. Grace comes. Nothing could stand in the way of grace to reach us. Why? Because Romans 5.20 says that where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. Grace is unlimited. No power, no sinful power can stop grace in search of your soul. God's grace is unlimited. God's grace is boundless. God's grace is powerful. God's grace is amazing. And if I may add with a popular song of the day, God's grace is ridiculous. She continues in Ministry of Healing 161. She says, God, Rejoices to bestow his grace upon us. Not because we are worthy, but because we are so utterly unworthy. Isn't that something? What a mighty God we serve. I go back to Ephesians 2. Wait, faith, it, grace is a gift. Our only claim to victory, she says, is our great need. And because of the constant commission of sin, we are constantly in need of the grace of God. Grace is not merely God's unmerited favor. Grace is not merely God's free gift. Grace is not merely his willingness to forgive. But grace, and this is a power moment in the message, but grace is an active 
energizing, transforming power to save. I repeat, I believe in repetition. It is an active, energizing, transforming power to save. Grace comes from the hands of God with pardon and power. Grace comes from the hands of God with pardon and power. Pardon to set us right and power to keep us right. Grace has the power to set us right and to keep us right. We are going down the wrong way. Grace turns us around and keeps us going the right way. Pardon and power. The woman who was caught in the act of adultery, she experienced pardoning grace. She experienced forgiving grace. When those men brought her before Jesus, she was caught in the very act. It was not something they heard on Twitter, Snapchat, email to them. Oh, they, they were right there. They saw her. We know the story. She came um, before Jesus in her humiliation. She was just cowering at the feet of Jesus when they threw her there. Caught in the act. There was nothing that she could have said to defend herself. Nothing. But she stood before grace personified. And when Jesus did what he had to do, he turned to her and he said, Woman, where are thine accusers? That is pardon and forgiving grace. Pardon and grace. She says, No man, my Lord. She didn't see anyone. And he said, Neither do I condemn thee. And what were his other words? What? Go? Go and do what? Go and sin no more. Why would Jesus tell her to go and sin no more? Come on. She's a, a human being. Right? But go and sin no more. That, that seems to be unfair. He was asking her to do something that he knew she couldn't do, right? Go and sin no more. She was terrified, humiliated, ashamed. Neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more. Jesus was not being unfair. He was not commanding an impossibility. Certainly not. Because the Son of the Lord says that all his biddings are enablings. You know, there are some companies that hire people to work and you may say well I, I don't have an income I don't know what to do he said it doesn't matter we would hire you we would train you we'd give you a box of tools and we'd set you on your way all God's meanings are evils when he gives a command he gives the power to obey that command he becomes as our efficiency. And I want to tell you that there's nothing wrong with the promises of God. The problem lies with you and the problem lies with me. Because we serve a God who is able to do abundantly more than we can ask or think. Don't look at yourself, but look at Jesus who has the power to change your life. In every command and in every promise of the word of God is the power by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise realized. When God gives a command, he gives us power to fulfill that command. And when Jesus said to her, go and sin no more, he was actually saying, I'm going to give you the power to keep you from sin. Amazing grace, page 21, paragraph 6. It is grace that gives us power to obey. It is grace that gives us power to obey. Without the grace of Christ, the sinner is in a hopeless condition. I want you to, uh, to turn your Bibles to Titus 
chapter 2, Titus 2, verses 11, 12, and 13. Titus chapter 2, we are coming up to a close here now. Titus chapter 2, verses 11, 12, and 13. Now, I love these verses of scripture. They are so powerful. Now, I want you to listen. The Bible says that, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. What bringeth salvation? The grace of God. And we know what salvation is after being saved and saved and, you know, doing the will of God. What grace is the vehicle. You got into your car this morning and you came to church. What brought you to church? Your Toyota. Your Mercedes. Your Honda. What brought you to church? Your Kia. That's the vehicle that brought you to church. Grace of God is a vehicle that brought us to Jesus Christ for salvation. Let's go to verse 12. Grace. The unmerited favor of God. The gift of God. The pardoning power of God. That brings salvation. Grace is the vehicle. And the, the verse says that, um, there's a part that, that skipped out there. But it says that the grace of God, this grace that brings salvation, had appeared unto all men. This grace had appeared unto all men. Our God is not a partial God. It is his will that all men be saved. Psalm Ages, page 37, paragraph 2. At the very crisis, she says, when Satan seemed to triumph, the Son of God came with the embassage of divine grace through every age, through every hour. The love of God has been exercised towards fallen race. What a mighty God we serve. God loves us with a love that we could never, ever understand. Never. Friends, may say they love you. And desert you in a time of need. Close members, family, love you and desert you in a time of need. But Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God has enveloped the whole world with an atmosphere of grace. Saving grace is available to all. Transforming power to live above sin is available to all. We accept it with the hand of faith. So when grace comes, you are talking about grace. The power to, try to reclaim you. The power to transform you. The power to turn you around. The, problem, the power to have you living according to the will of God. That is what grace does. Teaching us. Denying what? Ungodliness and worldly lust. That we should live how? Soberly. Don't be intoxicated with the things of this world. Inebriated with false doctrine. We should live soberly. And how? Righteously. And how? Godly. Where? In the world to come? Just before our Jesus comes, where at the resurrection, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly where? In this present world. There is power in this present world. Don't let people tell you that you cannot be what God wants you to be, that you cannot be what God expects of you. Power is available. All we got to do is to tap into it. Just tap into it. Sometimes you may be tinkering with your uh, electronic device at home. It might be a TV or something. It's not working. I may have to get a tech to come here. But you are looking, checking the back, looking all over. But lo and behold, when you look, guess what? It's not plugged in. We need to plug in to the power that is available. Right now, the 
because when Jesus comes, it would be too late. Final quote for today. Enfeebled, I want to I say something before we this. I want to say something. The church is not a perfect place. The church is not a perfect place. Some of the law says that there will be sin existing in the church until Jesus comes. So when you come in here, don't expect everybody to look all holy and nice and all this. So you'll be disappointed. You'll be disappointed. Because we are here worshiping. You know who is here? So we know the angels of God are here. Satan and his evil forces are here too. As he says that while God is working to bring um, good people into the church, Satan is working to bring evil ones into the church too. Remember it was a mixed multitude that left Egypt, right? And they created all the problems along the way. But listen to this. In feeble and defective as it may appear. But I want you to forget about lunch or whatever. Just listen to this right now. That macaroni pie could stay. Just, 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 just listen to this right now. Enfeebled and defective as it may appear. Talking about the church. It is the one object upon which God bestows his supreme regard. Isn't that something? And listen, we are talking about transformation and change and grace. But right in the church that is enfeebled and defective, this is what God is going to do. Okay? So don't be disenchanted by people, what they say or do. Maybe pastors, elders, whoever. But you keep looking to Jesus Christ. But in the same church, look what God is going to do. She says, it is the theater of his grace. You know, back home, um, you know, we say somebody going to get a person, they say, he in the theater. <laughs> you know, he in the operating theater. Because that means that the doctor is working on him to get him well. God has a theater, and his theater is his church. And feeble and defective as it is. His theater is a church. And look what he loves to do in this theater of his grace. It is called the theater of his grace. In which he delights to reveal his power to transform hearts. Well, it's so good to see sometimes. You see people come to church and they think about them as nothing. They may come in not looking too good. You know, not talking too well. But you check them out in a few months. When you see them, you will not even notice them. You understand, you understand what I'm saying? God has the power to change lives. To set us right and to keep us right. I believe that. And it's all by his grace. All right. Our last text. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14. To 16. Paul says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Don't give up, brethren. I know times can be hard. Things will get rough. Sometimes you feel as though you are all alone in your troubles, your trials, and there's no one else to help. But don't give up. You have a high priest. Hold fast to your profession. For we have not a high priest who cannot sympathize with us. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows where you are. He knows what you are dealing with. He knows what's going through your mind even right now. He knows what you have to deal with during the course of the week. What you are going on to face. He knows. And he's touched with the feelings of your infirmities. But he's saying as he said to Paul. 
When Paul asked him three times, Lord, take this thing away from me. Lord, take this thing away from me. Lord, take this thing. God said, no, don't talk to me about this anymore. Paul, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Whatever we are doing, whatever we are struggling with, God says that his grace is indeed sufficient. For we have not a high priest who cannot be, uh, cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Give me verse 16, please. So, brethren, with that said, where there is a throne of grace, there is a king of grace. I know that you know him, but I want to reintroduce you to this king of grace. So whatever you are dealing with, he sent to us today, Paul is saying that, let us come to the throne of grace with confidence. Let us come boldly, while knowing that there at the foot of the cross, at the throne of grace, we will find mercy and grace to help in the time of need. Sometimes things can get so overwhelming you feel like giving up, throwing in the towel. I've been holding on to these principles for so long, but I can't do it anymore. I just want to give in. So let's all stand, please. I don't know what's going on in your life. I know what's going on in mine. <laughs> I want to invite you. You may be dealing with something, struggling with something, hoping for something. You want God to give you the power and the victory. I want to invite you to come boldly to the throne of grace. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at your friend. I want to invite you to leave your seat and to come boldly to the throne of grace on this evening. Divine grace is needed at the beginning of every step of our advance. It is divine grace alone that can complete the work. There is power. This power is available. You can tap into this power. Just leave your seat right now where you are. God is real, brethren. When we have issues, we need to take it to him. Sometimes it may seem long, but God is working. Even though we don't feel it, he's working. Even though we don't see it, he's working. He never stops. He never stops working. Oh, Father, your people, have come boldly to the throne of grace. We know, God, that this walk with you is not going to be easy. But we are encouraged that you are with us. And those who have come, you know them, God. Young, no, male, female, you know what the struggle is right now what they are thinking about in their minds right now, what they want you to do for them, Jesus. We know that you are caring, God, that you would provide the grace that is necessary. Meet each individual at the point of their need and provide what is necessary for them to keep on walking, to keep them walking along this path of truth. We pray for our young people. It's such a difficult time for them, oh God. On every hand, the earth seems to be against them. Dear Father, but actually keep them there, God. Your grace, your grace, oh God, by your grace, show them, dear Father. Be with us. Continue to keep us here at Mount Zion. Be with our leaders, dear God. Continue to help us to hold fast and to live by word and example. Not to say one thing and do the other. But we all need your grace. Show it down upon us, I pray. And 
we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As you go back to your seat, I urge you to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. the Lord Church. We needed that, didn't we? We needed that. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Goodness. This was grace. This was mercy. This was power. Yes. We needed that. Thank you, Jesus. Just want to quick throw out a quick reminder. Bible study later at 4 o'clock. And uh, it was powerful last week. God has promised us with. The word says, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Deacons, please stand. Let us pray. Father God, who gives bountifully, we thank you. Thank you for the gifts and the givers. As we return it, may your blessing be upon it, so it will go to further the work that you've intended for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We just want to remind you of two things. So, uh, one, we have Sabbath school for our, our young kids again. So, we want to remind you every Saturday, start bringing out your kids at 10 a.m. Make sure that you support this program if you want to keep seeing it. So, 10 a.m. for our youngest kids every Saturday. And then we have some birthday cake as you are leaving. So, make sure you stop by the front desk and get yourself some birthday cake. All right? forever and ever for all the things that you've done for me. Lord, we say blessings and glory. It all belongs to you. Yeah. Oh. I just want to praise forever and ever.
Father, indeed, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We are thankful for what you have been able to accomplish by the presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst today. Bless us, continue to keep us as we continue to grow in grace. These mercies I ask in your son's name. Amen and amen. And remember, family, we are at Mount Zion loves you and there's nothing, absolutely nothing you can do about it. Blessings and glory and honor.